the mic, so I'll do it first. I'm Doc. Uh, I am co-founder of Ambele. We do uh, Agile Consulting, um, and glad to be here. This is my fourth or fifth time at uh, Agile India. Uh, always enjoyed this conference. He's a seasoned professional. This is my very first time in the uh, great country of India, so thank you for having me. Um, I am also co-founder of Ambele. I uh, spent many years as a business analyst, uh, now as a coach, very much focused on helping groups of people collaborate, communicate better. This tool that we're gonna talk about today uh, illustrates one way that we can do that. Uh, we're going to talk about decision making, basically. Um, you wanna, I'll just keep going here. So think about in your daily life, uh, on a regular basis with your teams, you have lots of decisions to make, uh, or someone on your team has decisions to make. And we want you to think for a second. There's paper on the tables. Uh, there's also some large post-its. Let's save those for another thing that we're going to do. So if you can grab a piece of paper and a pen and jot down types of decisions that you might make on your team, just examples of things on, your, on a regular basis, the types of things that you are having to either make on your own. So we'll give you a minute to do that. Okay, now th looking at those decisions, we want you to think about what challenges you might have in those decisions. What kinds of things prevent you from making those decisions? What kinds of things would be an obstacle that makes it difficult to make those decisions? And jot down some of those, just a kind of separate list or right next to those, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, finish the one that you're working on now. Yeah, there's a seat up here. There's actually one more up here if anyone else comes in. <laughs> okay, so now that you've got your a few decisions, few challenges, we want you to pair up with the person next to you and share those decisions and challenges. Um, just take a couple of minutes to share with your neighbor. Just the person, if you're at an odd uh, number, we can do groups of three. And just take a few minutes to share with your neighbor. Okay, if you haven't switched partners, make sure the other person gets a chance to share theirs as well. <laughs> it's like someone had my timer already set for me. <laughs> okay. Now that you've had a chance to, to share with your table, we'd love to hear a couple of examples. Who wants to share some of the challenges that they're facing with teams? Any volunteers this morning? Okay, yes. What is? Okay, prioritization. Okay, so having multiple meetings and trying to prioritize between different meetings and different tasks. Okay, you had something? Okay. 
sure, sure. Hiring decisions uh, and all the... Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was too much for me to repeat, <laughs> but I appreciate you sharing. I think everyone um, heard you in the room, and I'll I'll pass the mic if someone has one more we want to share. It's the impact, uh, the trade-offs associated with the decision making. Do you always have more than one right answer? Which one to choose? Which one will have the appropriate uh, impact? Which doesn't. Uh, which serves the best for the organization and the team. That's a big uh, constraint in the decision. Right. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. So one of the things that comes up uh, often when we talk about, especially decisions on a team and trying to make team level decisions, one of the questions that ends up coming up is actually, should, should we involve everyone in a decision, everyone on the team? Uh, and I'm going to walk you through uh, a, a, a scenario. Uh, you may have experienced something like this. Uh, this group of people is actually considering getting chairs for their office. They have decided they want to buy new office chairs. And uh, the conversation begins. And it kind of continues along these lines. Now, as you look at this conversation, what are some things that you notice, if anything? What do you notice in this? In this? So everybody's, everybody's got their own opinion, right? So we got a bunch of different opinions uh, represented. Uh, can you guys read this? Yeah. What, uh, what else do we notice? So differences in thought process, absolutely. So we're coming at it from different angles. Uh, maybe we're thinking about different priorities. Is there anything else that stands out? I miss that. Everyone's looking for their own comfort zone. So we said, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that always stands out for me when I look at this, of course it does for me because I made this slide, but in many conversations I've experienced this exact thing. What's this person saying? I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. Okay. So personally, I had an experience where uh, it was a startup, and all of our uh, software developers were out in the field. They were all working at clients, and we decided that we wanted to open a studio. So we were going to bring a bunch of the developers in, and we were going to start writing custom software for our customers. So we're all on HipChat, because back then that's what we used. And I asked the question, what type of keyboards do we want to use in the studio? And, you know, someone threw out, oh, uh, you know, the Mac keyboards are the best, and there's a whole bunch of chatter. And then someone said, oh, the Mac keyboards with the extension for the numeric keypad, a bunch of chatter. And this guy came and goes, well, I don't really care, but we could all use Microsoft keyboards. And then lots of chatter. It starts to die down, and this same guy comes back and he goes, it doesn't matter to me, but, and he made some other suggestion, and there's a bunch of chatter again. So I direct messaged him, and I said, what's going on? He said, what do you mean, what's going on? I said, you keep saying you don't care. He's like, well, I, I, I don't care. I'm gonna, wh why don't you care, first of all? He said, well, I have carpal tunnel syndrome, and I hand-built my own keyboard. Whatever you put in the studio, when I show up, I'm going to unplug whatever you give me and plug in my custom keyboard. So I literally don't care what you put in the studio. OK, then why are you in this conversation? And he said, because we're all in the conversation realize that sometimes we don't want everyone involved in the discussion. Not everyone needs to be there. Yeah. And that's one of the important elements of this technique. It's a way to allow people to opt in and out of decisions and be explicit about it. Um, sometimes we have these situations where no matter what we say, the boss is going to come in and just tell us what we're going to do. So why even bother to have the conversation? And that's OK. There are situations when that's appropriate. Sometimes there is one person who is equipped with everything they need to make the decision. So why do we need to go to a meeting to talk about it? Just let that person ha make that decision. Um, and that's some of what we're going to uncover today. So this is going to be fairly interactive. Uh, I'm going to 
at the moment assign each of you a certain role. So, so bear with me as we figure this out. I would like the person who's sitting closest to the door to stand up. It's only for a moment. You're all going to get a chance to stand up, so don't think. At each table. At each table. Yes, sorry. <laughs> That's an important distinction. So if everyone closest to the door, someone at your table, just stand up. You're the first person, the first role we're going to assign. We just need, yeah, one per table. Don't worry, it's, you're not going to have to do anything. This is just to help me figure out to make sure we have one person at, at each table. So you are now being hired as the product manager. Okay, so remember the role that I'm giving you. You're the product manager. You're in charge of the overall product strategy, market fit. You've got some product owners that you manage. Um, and they work on specific aspects of this product that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and you like to be in charge. You're, you're very much, uh, you're competent, you're really good at your job, and you like having that authority. Okay? You can have a seat. Now, the person to their left, if you could please stand up. Make sure I get all these. Okay, so you are the product owner. You report to that product manager. You work with the teams directly to implement some solutions. You take direction for the product manager, but you have some authority on your own to make decisions with writing stories, prioritization of the backlog, kind of typical product owner stuff. Um, you're there to support the teams kind of on a regular basis. Okay? All right. Continuing on to their left. Thank you. All right. Here's our dev managers. So you are in charge of all the developers. You've got a, a small group of, let's say, seven or eight developers that report directly to you. You manage everything that they do. Um, you used to write code, but you don't anymore because you're too busy doing all this manager stuff. Um, but the direct reports still rely on you for the day-to-day -day stuff. Okay, you can have a seat. Person to their left, we might just loop around here. If <laughs> You're our testers for our product, okay? You may help some with requirements definition, you know, if you are far along along uh, on your uh, agile journey, you work with automated tests and you do some exploratory testing. So an all-around, all-purpose tester. You can have a seat. The person to their left, if you could stand. OK, you're our developers. You're the ones slinging code on a regular basis. Uh, you might be in involved in some architecture discussions. They might pull you in, but you're pretty much every day on the team writing code. Um, Unfortunately, you spend a lot of time in meetings that you wouldn't like to. Uh, you'd rather be spending time at your desk writing code, but that's just the, the way the job works. So you can have a seat. Um, OK, we have a few more roles left. So this table up here, yeah, you've got everyone you need. So you're, you're OK with the roles that you have. As long as you have a developer and a tester and some product owner, you're good. So for these additional folks who have stood up, uh, yep, thank you very much. You're our lead architect. So you're responsible for the overall architecture for our company. You worry about standards, security. Um, teams might not always be happy to see you coming when, they, when you come into meetings. Uh, people are a little hesitant sometimes to tell you what's going on because they're afraid you're going to tell them they can't do what they want to do. I've never met an architect like that, but let's just hypothetical for the purpose of this, this session. So you can go ahead and have a seat. And I th we should have at least one more role, I think, at each table. Go ahead and stand up for me. You're the project managers. Uh, you make sure that all the deliverables are clear, that the deadlines are clear for the team. You make sure the team hits their targets, that they meet their velocity goals. And you're the one in charge of all the status reports that have to go to leadership, if you're still doing those sort of things. Um, and you do help the team remove roadblocks, try to help them to do their, their job a little further. OK, you can have a seat. And do we have any one left? OK, if you would like to stand up for a second, let me just christen you as developers as well. Because we have lots of software to write, so we're going to ask that you help the developers, so you're going to be in the developer role. Okay? These roles will be important as we go through this scenario. So remember sort of who you are and how you 
um, might approach this problem that we're going to be talking about. So let's pretend that we work at this large transportation company, uh, you know, cabs, taxis, that sort of thing. Um, we are in a big city. And we want to differentiate ourselves. With all the competition out there with Lyft and Uber, we've decided we're going to offer an app that allows people to order a cab and a coffee. So when you are taking a cab to work in the morning, you can have your cappuccino at the same time. This is our big idea that we think is going to change the world and differentiate us. Okay, so this is our, this is our company. So, what we, we get, get that kind of in your head, this is this new project. You want to, for the rest of our time here, we're going to be thinking about a new app that we're going to build to allow people to order coffee and a cab at the same time. Okay? okay. All right, so the first thing I'd like you to do, or we'd like you to do, is uh, on the... Uh, larger post-its here, these three by fives. So if we can, if we can get these open, at all the tables. Uh, just, just thinking about this app, uh, and uh, you know this product, and then your specific role. Write down three or four key decisions that would need to be made in order to get this thing off the ground. What are some things that need to happen from your perspective and your role at the company? in order to launch this coffee in a cab, cab in a coffee concept. Uh, again, one per post-it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the so so the the logistics of uh, cab and a coffee. What we're concerned with is we need to write an app where people can actually make this happen. Right. Um, so that is our primary focus. Now, as as product managers and owners, you might be thinking broader in terms of market fit, et cetera. Right. It is important that we have just one per post-it. You might be thinking about the infrastructure that's needed. You might be thinking about who are the target customers. All right, why don't we go ahead and finish up whatever one you're on if you're still writing. Okay. All right, and once you're set, okay. Now what I want you to do, at your tables, working together, I want you to just create one list. So just kind of go through them, look at them, remove duplicates, and create a list of the decisions that need to be made. Yes, OK. Yeah, yeah, I feel like we're right on track for that as far as our timings are good. OK. Yeah, if you've, it, uh, if you've got duplicates, just go ahead and, and uh, pick one. Yeah, if you've got duplicates, just pick one. Yep, you're going to try to reduce it down to a single list. Yeah. 
So re really, the majority of this exercise is removing duplicates, right? It's just making sure that, that if you've got ones that are the same, they're, they're, they're removed. Uh, this does not need to be a comprehensive list, nor do you all have to agree on the list. All we're really trying to do is remove duplicate items. Okay, does anyone need more time to read the, the lists, the items? I think we've got all of them kind of generated. We've at least read them all so we know what they are. Now we're going to go through a quick prioritization so that we stay focused for this session. Okay, so for each of the roles, uh, actually for everyone at the table, what we're going to do is you're going to have one turn to pick one of these as your a favorite as the one that you want to make sure we we use for the rest of the exercise. So starting with our product manager, you get to pick first. So whichever decision you think, yes, that one's really important to me. I want to make sure we talk about that one. And yes, not necessarily. If you yeah, if you heard a wonderful decision that someone else brought up, you can pick that one. So any, all of the ones in the middle of the table are the pool from which you can pick. So the product uh, manager will go first, and then we'll just go left just as we assign the roles. So at the end of this exercise, there will be the number of stickies as there are people at the table. Okay, so this table only has five people. You will have five decisions in the middle of the table. If you have eight people, you will have eight decisions. Does that make sense? Yes. Then, then pick the next thing that you like the best. Right. Yeah. When it's your turn, you pick the one you think is most valuable from the pool remaining. Yes. And it's not like you're taking it. You're still going to leave it there on the list. Then when we're done, we'll remove the other ones just in an effort to focus in on the top five or eight different decisions. Okay? So... Starting with our product manager, go ahead and pick your, your favorite. Oh, no, just from your table. So who's your product manager? Okay, so just choose which one that you like the best and just move it off to the side. And then you're the product owner? Okay. And then just continue on. So you will have six stickies over there to the left. Versus 
Okay. Yes, you want to end up... Oh, you had just as many cards as... Oh, well, perfect. Then they're all prioritized. <laughs> you didn't have to make any decisions on that. <laughs> Once you have your prioritized list, your, your selection, you can move the other ones off to the side. So clear that space in the middle of your table. You want your list to be to the left, if that makes sense. Whatever way you can read them, make a linear list of them. So someone just asked whether we need to actually order the list that is on the tables. That's less important for this exercise. We're not worried about putting the remaining items you have in any kind of order. Uh, we just wanted to narrow it down to the top eight or nine. So clear the space in the middle of your table other than that list. So if you look at the, the slide up there, you want your list to be on the left-hand side of your table. Okay, looks like everyone's getting there. Okay, one last one up here. All right, so at this point, you should have just one single list. Uh, it is to the left, uh, and you've got a clear space on the center of your table. So that list is the leftmost of that clear space on your table. This will make a little more sense in just a second here. OK, so. Collaboration contracts. This is what we're here to talk about anyway. This is what we're, gonna, what we're gonna be learning for the rest of the day. So let's make it a straight list to the left of the open, there you go. All right, so with a collaboration contract, what this is designed to do is a couple of different things. It is designed to help us figure out who is involved in the decisions and how is the decision going to be made. It's, we found over and over again with groups of people especially, there ends up being these weird dynamics where we get together as a group and we don't understand up front who needs to be involved so we have maybe too many folks involved, or we don't understand and agree up front how the decision is going to be made. And so we think, some of us think that we are working as a group to come to agreement and some of us think that I am the only decision maker, and everybody else is just here to inform me about stuff and things. Awesome. Right at the point where we need it the most. Well, I don't think they did anything. I think it's the TV. Got it. You are so good at these. OK. So with the collaboration contract, what we end up doing is each individual on the team looks at a decision that needs to be made or all of the decisions that needs to be made and they self-select into a role. So when you look at this decision, you go, you know, for that decision, I believe that I belong in one of these roles. And the roles are explain. If you say that you are in the explain role, what you're saying is, I am the sole decision maker. I alone will make this decision. And I will explain my decision to the rest of the group. I don't need their input. I don't need any additional information. I know what I'm doing. This is my decision. If you say you are in the consult role, you're saying that you are a sole decision maker. This is my decision and my decision alone. The difference is I'll consult with others before making my decision. So I'd like to get some information from them. I'd like to hear their opinions. I'd like to see what data they have. I will then make the decision and, of course, explain that decision to the group. 
You understand the difference between these two? They're both sole decision makers. One of them needs no input from anyone. One of them wants to get some information before they make the decision, okay? If you say that you are in the agree role, what this means is I'm a decision maker, but I want to be in agreement with others who are also decision makers. We will gather information, we will talk amongst ourselves, we will come to an agreement, and that will be the decision. Right, so this is a collective decision making role. If you are in advise, you are now saying, I don't actually need to be a decision maker. Somebody else can make this decision, but I have information or a perspective that I think is valuable and I would like to share that with the decision maker to help inform their decision, right? If you are in accept, you are not a decision maker, you have no information to share, and you will accept the decision as made. And if you are in abstain, you have no idea why you got invited to this meeting in the first place. This decision has no impact on you. You so not care you don't want to be here at all. Right? But it's possible, right? It's every, every once in a while we end up invited to some meeting and we have no idea why we're there. This has nothing to do with me in any way. So those are the roles. Any questions on these roles? What we're doing is each of us is saying, based on this decision, what role do I think I belong in? So let's give an example here. Okay. I don't remember what the scenario is. And I have no notes on it. Um, so uh, here, a group of people, we've had to make some, some form of decision needed to be made. Uh, Joe indicated that, hey, I'm in consult. It's my decision, but I'm going to consult with others. Luckily, Alice and Susan both have some information. So they want to advise Joe before he makes the decision. The rest of the group is either in accept or abstain. Frank doesn't know why he was invited at all, right? Now, the way that we do this is we do it anonymously, or at least we don't share our answers with the rest of the group until all at once. So right now, I'll hand it to you in a second. Uh, you have your list of cards along the left-hand side. What we want you to do is make the headings for each role and place them along the top. So again, using those uh, three by five cards. Okay, so use, using those larger stickies, make headings. So make six different post-its that say each of those words and you're basically gonna build this on your table. Okay, so you've already got your ideas over here, your decisions, and you're gonna stick headers across the top. Yes, exactly. Yep, they're headers. Yes, exactly. You're basically building a little matrix. Yes, perfect. Yes, so write the words explain on one sticky, consult on a sticky, agree on a sticky, advise on a sticky, and then you're going to put them across the top. Yeah, and they need to be placed at the very top because we're going to fill in the center there. Oh, they're gone. Um, I would carry on without them. You'll be able to still uh, do the rest of the exercise. Uh, you may have some interesting things come up. You, it may be more valuable without them here because you'll realize we we're not the right people to be making this decision. So it, it might be okay. So a dev manager is actually just a supervisor in charge of the developers. So more of a supervisory role. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Doc. Yes, we've got some square post-its we're passing out now. We're going to use for deciding what we want for each of these decisions.
And this seems a little uh, cumbersome the first time you do this. Once people know how to use this technique, it takes minutes to set it up. We've even done it electronically with teams that are distributed. Uh, there's different techniques for capturing this information uh, that is kind of fast and easy w when we do it electronically. And it is even uh, faster and easier the more times you do it. So I appreciate your patience with just working through the mechanics. Okay, all right, so the next step, and this is an important step, uh, in silence, on your own, you are going to make your role selection cards for each of these decisions. So, um, a card will look like this. The number in the upper left-hand corner is the decision that it belongs to. So starting at the top, one, two, three, four, five, however many decisions you have, right? In the middle is your name. Bottom right is the role that you are going to select. Are you explain, consult, agree, advise, right? What role would you select for that specific decision? So you will make as many individual cards as there are decisions on your, on your board. Keep all of the cards to yourself. We got it. I, it's easier to flip that way than it is the other. Okay, just so that everybody can see it, those are the roles and what they mean. And remember, this is for you in your position on this team for this specific decision. Where do you think you belong? So as a reminder, you're silently doing this, you're keeping them. If anyone ever in the, the early days of doing um, estimation where you're doing a fist of five and you do it all at the same time, we're trying basically to remove anchoring. So if you see someone else put theirs in a certain place, then you might be influenced about what you really want. So we don't reveal our cards. And remember that the left-hand side, the explain, consult, and agree, they're the decision makers. The ones on the right-hand side are support, if you will. They don't make the decisions. Yes, who do not lay the cards out. You should have a little pile in front of you, which is why we have them numbered, so you can remember which thing, uh, which decision you picked which role for. It's key to this process that the reveal is done all at once. As Diane had pointed out earlier, if someone starts filling out the board, it creates anchoring. Other people look at those answers and they start to think about, oh, maybe that means I should be in some other role. And now we're not getting honest answers. All right. How are we doing? Do folks need more time? Looks like we got a little bit. Yeah, I think the more decisions we have, the harder it is, right? Do you want to? 
yeah, th this team back here still needs more time. There's 12 people that came off. Yeah. <laughs> All right, looks like everybody's ready except for maybe our largest table back here. Is there any other folks, do anybody need more time or are we all set? Okay. Okay. All right. So let me um, advance the slides forward a bit here. Okay. So that's where we were. Go for it. Yep. Okay. So now, again, silently, you don't need to discuss this at this point. Lay out your individual cards in the spots where they go. So for the first decision, Sarah, for the first decision, was an agree, so she placed her sticky there in the agree, under the agree heading. If there are more than one post-it for that area, it's okay, just kind of overlap them. We're not kind of debating anything at this point, we're just kind of revealing now. Okay, looking good. Yeah, so if you need to spread it out across the table, it can make it easier to read. Looking good. Okay, looks like we're just about finished. Okay. Okay, once all of your uh, stickies are placed, go ahead and have a seat. That'll help us know that you've placed all of them and we can talk about the next step. So as you finish, go ahead and look at your map and see if you notice any trends, see where other people have placed things. We're not really debating or discussing at this point, but it gives you a chance to take in what other people might be thinking. I don't know. Okay, once you've placed your items, go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> it's interesting to see how the bigger the team, the harder it is and how that actually reflects our reality. When we have 12 people trying to make a decision, 
it takes a lot more time than five people trying to make a decision. Okay, we're going to talk next about how to deal with conflicts we might see on this. Yep, yep, okay. Yeah. No, it can work for big teams too. De definitely. It actually is more helpful for big teams than it is for, for, for small. And it's more helpful for multiple decisions versus just one. Um, and we'll go through that a little bit in the, in the, in the, as, we, as we roll forward, right? Okay, so it looks like most of the tables have theirs laid out fairly well. So the way that it should look basically is you've got idea one. Along that column, all of the one answers, right? Then you've got idea two. Along that row, all of the two answers, right? So it should be fairly easy to read as you look at it. You can see who selected what role for which of the decisions, right? So let's take a look at this. You may have already noticed a couple of things about this as you look at your board. There might be situations you're looking at it going, hmm, how is that possible? Well, it might be that it's not possible. One of the things that collaboration contracts reveals for us is conflicts in our expectations of decision making. So we're in this group meeting. We need to make some decisions. I think I'm the sole decision maker because I'm the boss around here and no one knows better than me. And you think that we should be in agreement. Now, if we haven't had that discussion, what happens? We start to have some really weird dynamics, right? I feel like you're not letting things move forward because you're being resistant. You feel like I'm being overbearing because we haven't, we haven't created this understanding. So collaboration contracts, we do it this way, can reveal conflicts. So let's take a look at this particular situation. If we look at this situation, doesn't matter what the decision is, do we see any kind of an issue with this? Yes, it's not that I don't have a decision maker, it's that I have multiple decision makers and they're in conflict. So I've got Joe thinks that he is the sole decision maker. I will make this decision on my own. Alice says, I am also a decision maker and I want to be in agreement with Joe. Well, Joe can't make the decision on his own if Alice needs to be in agreement with him. We can't have both of those things. So what might we do to resolve this particular situation? What needs to happen? Any ideas? Sure, okay, so we gotta talk about it, but from a roles perspective, what needs to happen? So where does that decision fall? If there is a requirement to create a decision, what's the role that person is decision making? That person can have a higher authority or higher. That's that's great. So what you're saying is that hierarchically within the organization, someone should or shouldn't have this role, right? Right now, Joe thinks he's a sole decision maker, Alice thinks that we need to be in agreement. How that's resolved, whether it's because, hey, hierarchy says Joe's the boss, so Alice, go pound salt, or, Sorry, yeah. Joe's 
So it may be appropriate that, Joel is the, that Joe is the sole decision maker. That's fine. What needs to happen? Right? Not, not, not. We need clarity. How do we get that clarity? Either Joe needs to move down into agree and says, yes, Alice, you and I can agree on this decision. Or Alice needs to move down into advise. She needs to say, hey, you know what? It makes sense that Joe actually makes this decision. I trust him, but I have some information that he might want in order to make that decision. Now we've got clarity, right? Why we did it, if it's because Joel's in a particular role or whatever, that's a separate item and it needs to be figured out. But it's once we've had that discussion and Alice moves down into advise in this particular case, it is now Joe can be the sole decision maker and we don't get that weird dynamic between people where one of us thinks one thing and one of us thinks the other, right? So there's actually a number of possibilities here. This chart's a little difficult to read, but it actually makes a lot of sense once you get, once you get looking at it. For any set of decisions, for any decision, if you have one person in explain, you cannot have anybody in, soul, in consult, agree, or advise you can have one or more people in accept and zero or more people in abstain. Does this make sense? If you've got a sole decision maker, you can't have another sole decision maker, nor can you have group decision makers. And if it's the person who's going to explain and needs no input from anyone, then there are no advisors because I ain't listening anyway. If someone is in consult, you cannot have anyone in agree or explain, but you can and need at least one person in advise. And then accept and abstain can have as many people as they want, zero or, zero or more. Does this make sense? You can have two or more people in agree, at which point the rest, these roles down here can have zero or more in them. And then all of these are, whoops, no one's a decision maker. That's also a problem. And believe it or not, it happens on occasion. There are things that we need to decide, and it turns out that everybody's in advise and accept. And no one's going to make the decision. And that's a conversation that needs to happen as well. So what we'd like you to do, using this as your guide, look at your boards. And just on the first one, are there any conflicts? And if there are, what would need to happen to resolve that conflict? You don't have to actually have the debate and resolve it. Just want you to have the discussion about what would need to happen to resolve it. What are ways that this could happen? Someone can move to this role or that role, right? And then go down to your second one. Yeah, and just to add to that, as you're trying to figure it out, think about your role that you're playing. So to your point about who's the most appropriate person to make that decision, let that be your guide. Uh, as you're trying to solve the conflict, think about who's the most appropriate person to make that decision. I think so too. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Do you, so you want to do the next? We yeah, I'll just, we, I'll just talk just, to just it. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Okay. If we can have everyone have a seat, we're having some great conversations. Lots of, lots of uh, great 
ideas coming forward here. We just want to, excuse me, go over a couple of things because we've only got about 10 minutes left. Okay, so in this first row, we had talked about how there couldn't be someone in agree and consult. And that was, we showed you that chart, it's all about numbers and you can't have people in all these roles. There's another thing that came up in a lot of the discussions that we just wanna summarize. In this example, we've got a whole bunch of people in, in agree and we look at that and just names, we think, okay, there's no conflict here. But what if the decision we're making has to do with the product we're developing and Susan is the product manager? We might look at that and say, okay, uh, Susan, we kind of want you to help with the decision. That's sort of your job. We, we want her to, to either move into agree or to slide up here into consult or explain. Sometimes we notice things when we do these agreements that don't make sense to us because we're looking for leadership. We're looking for someone to kind of step up. So did you go ahead and advance? So we might decide that a couple of, once a couple of people hear that Susan is gonna, okay, she's gonna take care of this, she's gonna move up into agree, they might slide down and be like, okay, you know what, I don't have to be there. If Susan's gonna be there, then I don't have to be there. We need to get comfortable trusting other people to take care of the decision. Uh, right now I'm working at a company where everyone goes to every meeting and it is, as you can imagine, very ineffective. Many times someone's sitting in a meeting on their laptop working on something else because they feel like if they don't go to this meeting, they're gonna be missing something, but yet they don't really participate in the meeting that they're in. So what we're trying to create is an environment where it's okay to not attend. It's okay because you know you can go to Susan. She's gonna take care of this for this decision, so you don't have to participate in every single meeting. Okay. So a couple of things came up uh, while we were going around the tables. Um, so we looked at the different forms of conflicts, we looked at how they might be resolved. Uh, you know, a couple of things came up where people were asking me things like, hey, shouldn't we look at uh, the hierarchy of the role to determine who should be a sole decision maker or not when we have conflicts? My answer to that is, I don't know. I don't know, because I don't know your environment. We don't know your place of work and the culture that is there. So in some organizations, knowledge is more important than hierarchy. So your role is less important than the knowledge that you have, and that would influence who's, who might be sole decision maker or in agree. In other organizations, hierarchy is more important than knowledge. My role makes me the decision maker, right? So we can't answer that for you. What, what this tool is intended to do is help you establish a decision-making protocol and help to reveal those issues that otherwise surface after decisions are supposedly made, right? How many times are we in a situation where the decision's made and then someone else passively, aggressively goes off and does something completely different? Or there's some kind of back-channel, back-office discussion that's happening. Those are all a result of a lack of clarity from the onset, where someone thinks they're sole decision maker, someone thinks they're in agree, we don't talk through it, and it manifests in some other way. So we can't really tell you how to solve those conflicts. We can only show you that those conflicts exist, and then in your organization, you gotta figure out what's right for us in terms of how we resolve those. Does that make sense? I have my opinions about it, but I can't tell you what to do. Okay, so with our last couple of minutes, uh, take out a piece of paper if you would. I want you to think about how you could use this on your real team. So you had a little fake team today with your assigned roles. Think about situations that you might be able to use this with your real team. And we'll give you just a minute or two to write that down.
Okay, now while you're writing, I also want you to think about what are some of the things you learned today? Write down anything that comes to mind, any aha moments where you realized something that you didn't know when you came in, something you heard that maybe triggered a, a new idea for you. Jot down a couple of those. Okay, let's take a few minutes and, and share out some of that. So what might be a situation that you would use this with your real team in real life? In, in this case, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, I would like to share uh, this session overview with my team. And uh, instead of having, uh, so I'll go with these uh, exercises in the session. And when we'll be having actual uh, meeting, in that meeting, I'll ask the team that before coming to meeting, analyze yourself what is your bucket based on the agenda read the ag agenda and before you join the meeting uh, bucketize yourself in maybe agree accept somewhere so that you don't we, we uh, 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 for, uh, do that meeting efficiently that's a, that's a great idea right? how often we have agenda items but we still show up to the meeting and don't articulate what we want our role to be uh, in our case we don't see much of a conflict now the point is, this gives an opportunity to see whether we have been following a culture where we are not really getting into knowing if there is a conflict. This gives an opportunity to figure out amongst the team members whether we are trying to overstep someone and uh, not making an appropriate decision by giving an opportunity to somebody else speak out. Thank you. That's a, that's a great great use of this. Any other uses or new ideas? Uh, I believe uh, with this exercise, sharing it with the team, uh, like you gave the example of Susan, now the stakeholders will come up to own the responsibilities. So it will be like, uh, right now Agile is like team decision making, team decision making. Now actually the stakeholders will come and own that responsibility because we'll clearly see who is making the decisions. So. No, thank you. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that I see as a pattern is a product owner who maybe was on the edge and didn't quite know what they were supposed to be doing, especially people who are new to that role, suddenly realize the team needs them to make key decisions. So it's, that's a, a great use of that. Did you have something? <laughs> okay. It is mainly helping us to uh, identify who is required for a particular t kind of meetings. If it is a technical meeting, who is need to be involved? If it is a business related, so who is required? So this will help us to understand. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's one of the number one benefits people get out of it is because most of us hate meetings. So uh, hopefully it's a lot more than meetings. Once we get good at this technique, it's not just about who's coming to what meeting, but actually talking about uh, the different decisions being made. All right, so as we wrap up, um, this is being very slowly developed uh, at collaborationcontracts.com. Uh, the technique that we showed you today, you can use anytime, anywhere. Um, you know, you can do this on a dry erase board in a conference room. You can do this with uh, Google Sheets or any other number of ways you want to. Um, you can go check out collaborationcontracts.com. You can use it to create a collaboration contract and get some responses back. Uh, we're slowly but surely kind of fleshing that out. Um, you know, I encourage you to, to try using this in your own organizations in whatever way, you know, makes sense for you. Uh, and with that, we just want to say, you know, thanks for coming today and, and hopefully uh, you got some, some real value out of this.